Hey guys, it's me, Lindsay, with the Rockwell Group, and today I'm here with Simona Fino. Hi there. And we'll be talking a little bit about uh, what it takes to move into a rural property. So make sure to like, share, and subscribe. Uh, stay tuned and check out the rest of this video. <laughs> So again, today we're going to be talking about what it's like to buy a rural property. And today I'm here with my coworker, Simona Fino, and we're going to be covering a lot of different aspects of rural properties. One of the biggest things that I always tell people is, especially we get a ton of people that are relocating from um, nearby states. So a lot of Californians come up here because we're just right across the Oregon border. Um, and you know, a lot of people are looking for a more rural property, get out of the city living. They want to be away from their neighbors, but I always tell them, you know, there's Oregon living and then there's advanced Oregon living. Um, and a lot of the things that come with what I call advanced Oregon living are things like dealing with a well, what is a septic tank? wood burning stoves and things like that. So those are some of the topics that we'll be covering today. And so let's just get started. One of the first things that we'd like to talk about is what does it look like with a wood stove? So one of the things that you'll be looking at, first of all, is whether the wood stove that is in the home, whether it's certified or not. And that is a label, I believe the year is 1986. Um, that it needs to be that year or newer. And if it is not, then it is going to be someone's responsibility to have that wood stove removed because a lender wants to see that removed and an appraiser is gonna to wanna to see that removed and replaced with something more modern. And that's for environmental reasons. So that is something that um, we will look at closely when we're looking at the purchase of a home. And then uh, with a fireplace, a traditional fireplace, you're gonna to wanna to make sure you get that inspected, that you're having the chimney clean and making sure either that hasn't been done recently that you take care of that before you start your first fire in that fireplace. That's such a big deal. Um, making sure that that's cleaned and serviced appropriately um, and just knowing the differences when you're going into um, a contract to buy a home. Um, knowing the difference between you know a wood stove, um, an insert, uh, an electric stove, those kinds of things. Um, and all of that will come out in your inspections and working with a licensed realtor, of course, they're gonna go through those necessary precautions and make sure that you have the, the right paperwork in place to either certify the stove or you know making sure that you have those disclosures and the things that you need from the seller to make sure that you know it's in you know operating condition. Those things can be kind of costly if they're not. That's absolutely true. So you definitely want to make sure to take care of that. Yeah. Um, the house that we're in here in lovely Applegate has a beautiful wood stove right over there and we'll show you that in a second. Um, one of the key little pro tips also if you are uh, moving into a rural property with a wood stove in the winter time, make sure to put a little tea kettle right on top of it um, because it's going to help with the humidity in the air otherwise things get real sticky, like staticky, dry and very uncomfortable. Right. And you want to make sure that you have plenty of seasoned wood that's ready <laughs> yeah. to go. So you're not going to be just chopping down whatever's on your property and expecting to burn that right away. Mm -mm. Um, you want to make sure it's seasoned. And of course, there's different types of wood that you want to be conscious of because some have a uh, higher heat potential and others just don't burn very cleanly and can really do damage to your fireplace. So you want to be conscious of that as well. Yeah, and some properties even have certain CCNRs or whatever it might be that you might not be able to actually harvest the wood on your property. So that's something that you want to, you know, really diligently look into as well. But for the most part, a lot of your rural properties, you know, if you're bringing down a tree and you're letting it dry, you're able to then harvest that wood and use it for the following year. But you definitely want to let it season for about a year. I've had people move up here and you know, in August and September, drop a tree and think that it'll be ready to keep them warm by December, and that's not the case. Exactly, yeah. Another thing that we'll be talking about is wells and septics. Those are some really big key issues. Um, you know, just making sure that those things are serviced appropriately. There are certain addendums for all of these things, actually, that will go into your contract that when you're working with a licensed real estate professional, we'll make sure that those, those are in your contract and make sure that everything is super disclosed. So when it comes to a well, what are the things that you kind of take care of and look at and think about? Well, the first thing that you want to do is inspection. So typically, um, the buyer is going to pay for the well flow 
and also any additional water quality. So usually I recommend what's called the top 35. So the well flow is going to be looking at just that, the well flow. So you're going to want to find out how much water is the well producing. So in average, you know, they used to say that a lender would want five gallons a minute. That's not the case anymore. They don't, they don't have requirements, most of them. But if it's a low producing well, so if it's under five gallons a minute, it can be good to have a holding tank. And those are things that you can talk with the well companies and get more information on ways to enhance that. The other thing that you'll be looking at is your water quality. So by state law here in Oregon, the seller has to do what's called the purity test. And this is your bacteria, arsenic, and nitrate. So that's your basic water quality and making sure that those aren't present in the water. Then I always recommend that buyers get what's called the top 35, and that's looking at 35 different elements in the water, everything from magnesium, iron, boron, fluoride, I mean, there's a whole list. And you just wanna make sure that the water is clean and good for drinking. Or in the case of boron, which is okay for people, but not okay for plants. So if you're, <laughs> if you're aiming to grow a lot of plants, it can be devastating to plants. So, these are the things that we look at with a well. And then when those issues come up, if there's anything, then we usually work with the seller because there are a lot of remedies, even to something as scary as arsenic, which did you know, can occur naturally. It's naturally occurring, naturally occurring. Naturally occurring. Say that. Yeah. So you can have arsenic in the water and you can get filtration systems mm -hmm. that can either be at your sink or even at the wellhead so mm -hmm. that you're getting all of your water filtered. So there's usually a remedy for any of the situations that come up around well water. Yeah, they can do, I think it's like infrared treatments at the, the site of the well and be able to pretty much kill any like bad bacteria that can be harmful for you and your family. Yeah, so infrared, they also, uh, reverse osmosis is another one. And yeah, there's, there's all kinds of different ways to And then also one of the things that we see pretty frequently out here um, is if you do have a low producing well, a lot of people will have holding tank systems. Mm -hmm. um, and those are a really great option to kind of offset that well. Um, they can be a little costly at first, but a lot of times, I mean, it's going to save you long term down the road. Um, and then another option too is when consulting that, that well inspection company, um, you can always drill a secondary well. Um, we have things in the industry that are called witchers <laughs> and they, they literally go out on the property and they use a ton of different, you know, processes to kind of figure out where the best water supply might be. And you know, when the well was originally put in, let's say 1960s, 1970s, that might've been the best place, but now maybe aquifers have shifted or something like that. And there might be a better location for it. So the witchers can actually go out and give you a precise location of where they think the best water flow would be. Um, so you can always, you know, consult a, a witcher and a well, well flow company and, and maybe, you know, redrill a new one. Yep. That's always an option. So the other thing we're going to talk about is um, septics. Um, septics can be pretty tricky. Um, you know, sometimes you, you, I've had a ton of people, my best friend right now is having an issue with her leach field um, and trying to locate that. Um, I've recently been in the city and had an issue with my pipes and just figuring out what's new PEX piping versus what is galvanized pipes, things like that. Um, and during your escrow process and your uh, inspections, you can look into all those things. So when it comes to septics, what do we look at on the real estate side? Well, first of all, the seller usually pays for the pumping. So that means it's pumping everything out of that septic mm -hmm. tank. And then the buyer pays for the inspections. Um, you can also opt to pay for a camera scope. I usually suggest waiting to do that unless the septic company decides, hey, it looks like there's some issues or could be some potential issues with tree roots, for example, can get into those septic lines. So you're gonna be doing inspections to make sure that those lines are clear, to make sure that the tank is in good condition, and that's what the septic company will come out and take care of. Yeah, septic is super important, just making sure that it's in operating condition. Um, but then also you want to make sure that those leach fields 
are leaching away from the house or at least away from your well. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. Especially with, um, well, older systems can be, sometimes they were put too close to a well. Mm -hmm. There's lots of different things that can come up. And that's one of the things that we'll be looking at is when we look at that report to make sure that the septic system is in good working order. And then if you're um, buying a property that needs a new system for some reason, there are several different types of systems out there. Yeah. So there's a standard system and then there's what's known as alternative treatment systems. Um, alternative treatment systems can be a little more flexible. So if you don't have as much space or if the property is kind of small or just the way things are kind of laid out, an alternative system is a little more expensive. They mm -hmm. tend to run 30, 35 grand, and then you're looking at for a, a standard system is typically about 20 grand. Yeah. So it's an expensive thing. That's why you want to make sure that you're doing those inspections and that the septic is in good condition. Yeah, and a lot of times those costs can be something that you can negotiate into your contract before closing. Um, so that's why it's really important to stay diligent within your inspection period and you know kind of decide what what kind of things that you want to negotiate if that's something that the seller will provide a credit for or whatever it might be um, especially if your financing dictates that those are things that need to be fixed or repaired prior to close another thing to keep in mind with a rural property is your pets so out here you can get everything from bears to coyotes and you want to make sure that your beloved pets are well kept inside at night because you don't want them to disappear. And believe me, it does happen. So be conscious of that. So one other thing to note about Oregon, if you're considering to live, is, um, you know, Oregon likes to give you all the different weather patterns and seasons all in literally one day. Uh, at the same time. Yeah. Um, you know, we always joke that Oregon is like, oh, four seasons in one day, challenge accepted. Uh, and today is a very perfect example of that. If you can see some little snow flurries behind me, that's why we're all bundled up today. And then if you go just right literally on the other side of the property, you can see blue skies back there. So uh, that's, that's Oregon for you. You gotta be kind of ready for it all. One thing to consider is that some properties in Oregon have water rights. Water rights are excellent if you've got them. They can come in many different forms. Here, they're river rights, so they come directly from the Applegate River. I think, personally, those are among the best water rights where you're either coming from the Applegate River or the Rogue River. And the reason is, is because those are pretty much going to be there for sure. Um, the other types of water rights are Medford Irrigation District, Grants Pass Irrigation District, Talent Irrigation District, and those are a little more uh, controlled and that water is coming off of mountain flow, so it really depends on the season and how we're doing with water. And as you may or may not know, we, just like many other states on the West Coast, are experiencing a drought, and so those water rights can get cut off early in the summer. Water rights are also dictated by date, so the older your water rights are, the better. That is something that on this property in particular, they have excellent water rights dating back to the late 1800s, so that's a wonderful thing to have indeed. Water rights also are very specific to the number of acres, so it will dictate the water rights certificate, whether or not you are allowed to do maybe one acre or 10 acres, and that's also really important because you need to stick within that framework that, that they had given you. Another thing that we experience in living in the Applegate um, is a lot of times you can be added to a ditch line. Um, these are water rights that you pay to be basically a member for, and you can use that water typically for irrigation, um, a lot of times for your home gardens, things like that. But normally, you know, there's such a huge demand for water rights that a lot of times you might not have access to get onto that ditch line. So those are the things that you'll want with your realtor to look into on whether or not, um, you know, you can actually be a part of that ditch line or not. Um, a lot of times, you know, it'll be totally full. And then what that means is everyone is consuming too much water to let any new members on. So those are kind of things that you want to look out for. 
exactly and whenever you're in contract and there are water rights that is something that we help you research so that you can call the water master and be talking to them directly to find out exactly what those water rights are and what you can do with them mm -hmm. definitely so while we're here another topic that we'd like to talk about is um, fire risk and uh, you know the use of what we really refer to out here as defensible space um, a lot of times that's you know clearing out uh, trees that are close to your home and you know kind of just ensuring that your grass is mowed down and kind of what that looks like so I'm gonna have Simona here talk to you about it yeah, so in addition to making sure that you don't have trees right next to your home, you also want to make sure, especially branches hovering over your roof, that can prevent the danger, and low brush, anything that's super flammable like that, you want to keep away from your home as much as possible. Keeping things green is really important, so really watering right around your home. If you can, put a sprinkler system on top of your house, that's an added benefit. Um, one thing that can happen, although some what rare and I've got a great example right here is uh, the lightning tree as we refer to it so this tree was struck by lightning and I was actually here when that happened and witnessed it happen um, and it did burn obviously and that really could have presented a serious fire risk fortunately we're close to the fire department they were wonderful in responding and got here right away but those sparks could have landed on the house very easily so that's something else that you really want to be paying attention to. So definitely talk to neighbors because a lot of times they will also have good tips. But as a real estate agent, I have a wonderful booklet that I usually give all of my clients that gives you lots of information on how to create defensible space and how to protect your home. And make sure and check out that fire prevention booklet in the comments below because we'll attach that here so that you can have that as reference for your home. Another thing to consider is flood insurance. So not every property requires it. It really depends on how close you are to a river or a creek or where you are in a flood zone. So that's something else that we will look at when we're in the real estate deal, especially if there is a year round creek or river. So another thing that we're starting to see more of here is solar panels. So you can see right behind me, we've got solar panels on this barn here, and that can be a real asset on a property. Now, one of the things that we will be doing as agents is when you're in contract, we'll find out more information about that solar system. How new is it? Is it completely owned? Is there money still owed on it? Are you going to be taking over a contract? And also getting clear on what it's like to maintain a system like that. So those are things that we would look at while you're in contract. The other thing that we have here that I absolutely love is our three season gardening season. So like Lindsay has mentioned before, we have wonderful four seasons here. Gardens are absolutely a thing that a lot of people do. There are many, many organizations you can get in touch with to learn more about gardening and farming. Um, but one of the ways to increase your yield and to extend your season is a greenhouse. So this is a great example of a small greenhouse where you can be growing your greens all year round. You can have greens in the winter. So something else to consider and definitely an asset on a rural property. So oftentimes on rural properties, you're gonna find all kinds of structures. It can be anything from a barn to a shed. And one of the things, again, what we'll be looking at when we're in contract is if they are permitted or not. So that's something that you can find out from the county. And I always highly recommend that you go and visit the county offices in person and talk to them. They'll be able to pull up the address of the property and then they'll let you know what is permitted on the property. And if something is not permitted, what you can do about that. They will also be able to pull up any red flags. So if there's something funky going on, if there's an encroachment, um, maybe maybe the barn is built on the other property, neighboring property. That's something that you want to know. So they will let you know those kinds of things. So another thing we were talking about with water rights and what that looks like on the farm, um, especially on these very big rural properties, is you know you're going to really get in depth on some sprinkler systems. Um, you know, it's not just as easy as installing something that you got from Home Depot. Uh, you know, these sprinkler systems can be pretty complex and it's really important to get those checked out, um, you know, during your inspections. 
So irrigation systems can encompass all kinds of things. So a lot of times those systems are underground, obviously, those pipes, but you wanna make sure that everything's in good working order and have those tested and really get an irrigation specialist out there, especially if this is something that you are not comfortable working with or if you know absolutely you're going to be using the irrigation. Yeah. Another really important thing to consider when buying a rural property is the zoning. So we have a few different types of zoning out here. We have rural residential, EFU, which stands for exclusive farm use, and WR, which is uh, woodland resource, and OSR, which is open space reserve. So all of those mean different things as far as what you can and can't do on the property. So for example, EFU is often a very coveted property for those that want to farm and sell their produce. Um, it is considered the property that the type of zoning that you're going to want when you're doing a business as well. Um, whereas you can't do a lot of those same things on a rural residential property. So if you have specific plans for a property, be sure and let your real estate agent know that so they can make sure and get the right zoning for you. All right. So then a couple more things that we just want to talk about and touch on just briefly is, you know, what kind of equipment are we looking at? You know, what does it actually take to keep a big rural property like this up? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things to consider is, do you need a tractor? Are you going to need an excavator? Do you need even something as simple as a golf cart to move around? Because even though five acres or 10 acres might not seem like a lot, it is when you're going back and forth and back and forth. Well, and you know, at the end of the day, you got to remember it might be rural, but your trash can still pick up way out there. <laughs> yeah. So sometimes it might be nice to have like a little truck or, or you know, a, a mule or something to kind of uh, ride your trash cans all the way back out so you're not hauling them back and forth all the time. Yeah, absolutely. So think about what it is that you want to do on your property and just make sure you have the right equipment to do that. And keep in mind too, oftentimes sellers, when they're leaving, they'll be willing to sell you and offer some pretty good deals on things because it's easier for them to sell that to you than it is for them to carry that wherever they're going next. Yeah, definitely. All right, so, you know, after this video, we just hope that you guys learned a little bit and you were able to take a couple things away. Um, the number one thing to take away from this video today is just that, you know, come in prepared. Do your homework, work with a licensed real estate agent. Um, we'll be very diligent. We'll help do your <laughs> due diligence. Um, and just make sure that you can get into a property and just enjoy that rural property while you're there. And uh, make sure to like, share, and subscribe. Um, and definitely hit that bell for some notifications on any future videos. Um, and hopefully we can help you find that perfect rural property up here in Southern Oregon.